So uh, without further ado, we have our first uh, presenter, Manonya Shastri. Uh, she's going to take us through Pollock's paper on the death of Sanskrit. But before that, uh, each of these sessions, we have a particular chair. Uh, we will request uh, the chair for this session, uh, Rajiv Malhotraji, to please come on to the dais and be seated over here. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Kanan and Meera and all of them for having me over here. It's such an honor to be in the presence of such legends in the domain. I think the inaugural session did a fabulous job of setting the tone, setting with, with such clarity about what are the challenges that we face in the domain today. And what I found particularly interesting was that these are challenges not just of the domain, but what we are facing as an Indian society as a whole. You know, whether the way Professor Jha, all of them, they emphasize the lack of intellectual rigor that we find these days, the way we take over second rate, third rate, often nth rate interpretations of our own words and have them as the basis for understanding and developing templates and paradigms. All of these point to major challenges that you know we all have to uh, address. And as an independent inquirer, because I come from a background of science, I'm an astrophysicist. Um, so as somebody who loves this culture, when one wants to pursue it independently, you know, that is when one wants to appreciate the culture in a very non-biased, in a very unbiased manner. And in that pursuit, it sometimes helps to have the insights of an outsider, not just somebody from within the culture, but from an outsider. And for an outsider too, there are ways of perceiving an alien culture. There are, where India has seen over so many uh, centuries, where several foreigners have embraced our culture and contributed enormously to it. At the same time, there's also been critics who have been impartial, objective, and their inputs have to always been welcome uh, to balance our own you know, analysis of what, are the, what is the worth and what are the weaknesses. Then there is the type of critics whose motives and methods needs, need to be examined critically, not just the method, but also the motive. And in reading Pollock's work, I found both of them taking you know, equal uh, presence on the stage. In reading through his work, one of the first things that strikes is how his methods often reveal a fundamental difference in the way Oriental culture is studied from the Western perspective, and in this context, from the American Western uh, perspective, as well as the Asian perspective. You know? And that is for the method. But when one comes to the motives, especially in the paper, The Death of Sanskrit, Pollock very clearly establishes his motives in the very first part of the essay. He's very clear in, in expressing disdain for some of the recent uh, attempts that are going on in revitalizing the language. Very clear, uh, you know, very clear disdain. He says, in post-independent India, organizations and individuals are trying to promote distorted images of India's past. Those are the words that he uses. And when one questions, what are these distortions that he's talking about? It becomes things like the debates whether Sanskrit is native to India or not. What is its timeline? Is it, uh, is it really native to us? These are questions which, at least to even admit that they're debatable, is set aside. And he proclaims that these are not even the issues. And these are distortions that are being pop uh, propagated in today's age. Further, one gets the sense in reading through his uh, interpretation <coughs> that somewhere he seems to be missing the key understanding of the central role Sanskrit has played in Indian ethos. It is not, it is definitely a language, but more than that, how the greatest canons of our land 
you know, be it in spiritual, be it in intellectual, be it in uh, philosophical, have been expressed in this language. That central tenet, that seems to be missing when he calls any attempts, you know, of renewing it as partial repetition of romantic myths. That's what he calls them. I agree with him to the extent that it is very important that exaggerated claims of one's, uh, you know, national heritage should not be propagated. I agree with that. At the same time, somewhere one gets the sense that this process of rediscovery that post-independent India is facing, in the sense we are no longer willing to, at least a section of us, are no longer willing to wear the colored glasses that our oppressors have forced us to wear. We are now shedding it off. And we want to look at things in our own way. That doesn't seem to be welcomed. That process of discovery, that process of regeneration is firstly not welcomed and very thoroughly attacked. By, it's very important to recognize that there is a large section you know, of all the speakers that have repeatedly highlighted it today. There's such a large section of people in India for whom Sanskrit is so central. And it's very central to the very fabric of our land. And to associate this debate with only certain elements and dismissing them by not making the majority of India a part of this debate, that seems to be, to me, a very, very fundamental flaw in this whole process. Pollock says that it is the state's anxiety, which is, you know, that those are the very words he uses, which is forcing uh, funds and so on into reviving the language. After having done that, he goes on to list in the paper, he goes on to list all the attempts that have been um, made in recent past in reviving the language and how all of those are basically a waste of resources. His derision and disdain is very, very apparent and he leads us to the crux of his essay where he says this. Government feeding tubes and oxygen tanks may try to preserve the language in a state of quasi animation. But most observers would agree that, in some sense, some crucial way, Sanskrit is dead. With this very sweeping statement, one would want to know what exactly do you mean when you say Sanskrit is dead? Right? When do you declare a language to be dead? He leads up to it in a, an interesting way. He speaks about the differences between you know, written languages, spoken languages, and comes to the crux of it where he says he's calling Sanskrit to be a dead language in some sense because the death is a reference to the dearth of production of creative words in the genre of Kravya over the past one millennium. And to support this idea of him calling Sanskrit to be dead. He singles out particular instances over periods of thousand years that support this claim by invalidating a lot more other points that you know paint a contrary picture. So he singles out, that is one of the key features of his methods. Whatever instances suit the particular uh, claim he's trying to propagate. He considers Phases where emphasis was laid on documentation, reinscription, restatement of problems across genres as a period of decline and decay. Now, these are issues which are very debatable. Right? Why is he even holding Kravya alone as a genre and, and coming to conclusions from that? But he does not make any reference to the, any other picture. Secondly, among his methods, he does not make any reference or actively takes away any blame from some of the main political as well as social turmoils that India as a land has faced over the past thousand years. For example, he actively, dis uh, he actively discounts any effect of the uh, Islamic invasion on the social and cultural fabric of the land. In fact, he quotes how the oppressor has often saved um, Sanskrit. According to Pollock, it is the oppressor who in some way has always tried to revive the language, but it is the native uh, Hindu kings, the Indian uh, social and civic ethos, which has contributed to the death of the language. So it has nothing to do with any outsiders.
in further explaining his idea, he considers four very discontinued moments in the past thousand years to fight for his case. So that includes uh, the state of Sanskrit and what he calls the disappearance of Sanskrit literature, the Lady Vanishes, uh, from Kashmir. Then he considers the diminished power it held in 16th century Vijayanagar Empire. Then he considers Sanskrit during the modern age of Mughal court. And finally, in Bengal on the eve of colonial uh, epoch. So these are the four cases, very distinct, and sometimes artificially trying to force uh, you know, interpretations to emerge. And by considering the decline of Sanskrit in these four disconnected periods, he wants to show how the language has died. So if we consider the first case, the lady vanishes. In this, Pollock begins uh, by considering the state of affairs in Kashmir in 1140. Uh, he begins by describing a gathering that uh, Alankara has held to honor his brother Mantra and how the assembly is filled with some of the most august uh, you know, people of the age. There is uh, Ruyukya, there is Railokya, Jindokya, Kalhana, all of them are there. And every major branch of the language is represented in this august gathering. And this is in 1140. And Pollock mentions how from this zenith, in a matter of 50 years, Sanskrit has vanished from the valley. The intellectual zenith that was achieved, and then 50 years later, it has come down to the very decline. Then he tries to understand why this is happening. And in doing so, he holds the character, the way the Hindu kings behaved in, during the particular period as responsible for creating a scenario in which Sanskrit apparently disappeared. After that very brief analysis, he moves over to 15th century again, during uh, the time of uh, uh, Sultan Zain ul Abidin, who he holds as having tried to save Sanskrit. So what happens is, he's singling out particular instances without considering the turmoil the valley went through in that particular period. There's absolutely no mention of the impact of the Turkish invasion on Kashmir, right? Because we have read accounts, if, if one relies only on Pollock, then this is the picture that emerges. But if we go ahead, if we study what really happened in the valley during that period, and one realizes how the Turkish invasion, especially during periods by um, Shami, Sikandar Shami, who went on a rampage, destroying the temples, destroying the idols. These are attacks that permanently altered the nature of society in Kashmir. And, and not considering these as a part of the analysis and seeing why is it that a language declined. That seems to be you know, this, this way of intentionally leaving it out. He touches very briefly on the Monroe invasion of 1320, but he again makes no you know, a mention of the uh, Tibetan ruler, Venshana, who attacked Kashmir. None of these attacks, which completely changed the way society worked, are considered as having any impact on this. Instead, it is held that the Hindu uh, kings and their uh, excesses and their uh, demerits were responsible for the decline of Sanskrit. The, one of the methods the way Paul writes his paper is that, he briefly admits that the possibility exists that this picture of literary collapse needs further analysis. For example, whether words were truly destroyed in, you know, because Srinagar faced a lot of fires during this time, the capital city, whether words could have been lost over there. There is no mention of this. Instead, it is the Hindu kings who destroyed it, and it is the oppressor who tried to save it, but, you know, we couldn't uh, do it. I would actually, uh, there are particular statements that Pollock makes that are actually quite debatable. He says, for example, none of the possibilities seem very likely of anything being attributed to the Turkish invasions. Everything, it is a direct consequence of the debauchery of the Hindu kings, one has to assume, that for poets, political power had now become irrelevant to their lives and in fact an impediment. So he makes these very, uh, you know, hidden statements. But 
At the same time, there is a very uh, powerful reference to Sultan uh, Abidin's uh, uh, action where he goes and destroys the idol of uh, Goddess uh, Saraswati in a temple. This is still known. You know, this is said as the goddess made him do it. But when it comes to the Hindu kings, it is their debauchery which destroyed uh, the language. So one sees a sort of arbitrary application of standards, missing of very keen socio-political factors that altered the ethos of the land. That seems to be for the first case. Yeah, these are the factors, primary factors. Another thing is, uh, when he says la the lady vanishes, when Sanskrit has disappeared from the valley altogether, there is no mention of how even in the late 19th century, because uh, I remember reading this in Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan books and so on, how later on during the reign of Ranveer Singh, Sanskrit was actually very much revived. Many uh, Shaivism texts, many of them were actually very revived. Pandit, uh, Shahibram, Ishveshwara, all of them actually generated keenness for the language once again. And this is even as late as the 19th century. But these are set aside, there is absolutely no mention of this to highlight that Sanskrit is dead. You know, Kavya was no longer made in the 12th century, 13th century, so Sanskrit has disappeared from Vishnu. His next case is Sanskrit in the Vijayanagar Empire, the city of victory and knowledge. Here, one of the greatest Hindu empires ever uh, to have. Uh, formed in India. It is not the Hindu kings that he holds responsible, but one of his second uh, pet dichotomy methods, which is the clash between the vernaculars as well as the Sanskrit. One notices somehow in Pollock's work that it is not acceptable for him to have a picture where there is exchange of ideas, there is exchange of energies between Sanskrit as well as the vernaculars in an equal manner. Of course, the vernaculars are, you know, derived, they have their mother tongue. But he seeks to somewhere play out a sort of a rivalry between the two instead of the dynamic, lively exchange that actually existed. You know? He says it is the complicated politics of literary language and competition among the literary cultures. And in the case of Vijayanagar, that is between Sanskrit, Kannada, and Telugu. He brings a kind of a dubious, critical eye of seeing this whole multilingual scene in India, which uh, as an insider one would find very questionable, because it is not that way, because we know how there is a dynamic exchange, both the ways, not just one competing against the other. He makes rather startling statements about uh, some of the finest scholars that were there uh, in the road, such as Vidyaranga, for example, or uh, Sayana when he calls them as scholars capable of only reproductive and not original thinking. These kind of very debatable statements, and especially to be made of such scholars, points to the motive rather than the merit of the argument. That seems to be the primary thread. In further analysis of this particular uh, section, he studies the work of Krishnadevaraya, uh, which is Jambavati Parinaya, this work, instead of studying it for its literary merit, for what it represents, he says it is an instrument of the king's power, one of his other pet uh, methods. He says this, document, this work was more of a tool to propagate the king's power over his victory over the uh, Orissa king, Gajapati, instead of seeing it as something where Sanskrit, Sanskrit's literary uh, merit of that age you know, so on one hand, he says no new work is being created, but when you show him new work is being created, he says no, that is an instrument of power. That is not truly a literary work. He says Sanskrit's role was confined only to, yes, he, he says Sanskrit's role was confined only to that of the imperial documents. It is not a language in which living um, thought or the ethos is being expressed. He says that is the role that was played by, by, by vernaculars like Canada, for example. We have the entire Dasa, Dasa tradition. So he, he tries to build a sort of an artificial divide that Sanskrit was competing against the vernaculars for expression in these. But as we know, it has always been a very simultaneous, very dynamic existence. It has never been that sort of a competition. Uh, 
his further analysis, he notes that anything that has been written in journals of Shastras, for example, or anything apart from Pravya, where one has tried to reshape, reinterpret older problems and formulate newer solutions, these are seen as restatement and reinscription and not the ability of the language to produce new material. So this is held as one of the reasons why he sees Sanskrit to be dead. He does not consider how the language has been so robust that it is constantly questioning and trying to interpret the matter for the age. Instead, it is seen as genres that are not truly indicative of the dynamism of a language. So from Kashmir, then he moves over to Vijayanagar. In between all this, he skips a lot of very important um, uh, you know, political turmoils that have shaken the very fabric of the land. All of these are not given the due credit they deserve. And he comes over to the Mughal era, where he considers three remarkable poets, Jagannatha Panditaraja, Siddhi Chandra, and Kavindra Charya. These these belong to the Mughal era, and he considers their work and how they led to the Dabya uh, movement as being examples of how the Mughal emperors actually encouraged um, Sanskrit, and uh, they tried to uh, provide the stimulus to it. He first begins with uh, Jagannatha, who calls him the last poet to have attained uh, impact that was uh, not regional, it was part widespread. And he goes on to make references of how the quality of the kavya that they produced was very low, and hence it did not make itself, it did not find its way to grow further down and spread throughout the uh, country. He admits that Jagannatha's word, Bhamini Vilasa, Rasa they all mark a departure from the kavya style, and then goes on to analyze their personal lives. After Jagannatha, it is Siddhi Chandra. Siddhi Chandra was uh, at the Mughal court and Abdul Fazal, Akbar, they are all presented as men who tried to uh, provide patronage to Siddhi. And in the process, have all played very significant roles in Sanskrit. He believes that in spite of having the influence of Persian during the period, and in spite of having uh, you know, patronage provided to them, the fact that the scholars could not rise to the challenge of, pro of producing uh, you know, very innovative material is already an indicator of the complete decline of the language. After uh, Siddhi Chandra, he also considers Kavindra, Kavindra Saraswati, whose work he describes as being very conventional and lacking, of, lacking in innovation. To summarize this particular era, he says, what Sanskrit learning in the 17th century prepared one to do, to infer the words from to infer from the words of these poet, was to resist all learning. So there is absolutely no mention of all the other genres of all the other work that has been done, and he reduces this whole era to that. So Sanskrit learning closes you off to the impact and influence of any other language. His fourth. His fourth example, I mean his fourth uh, uh, case, is the colonial period, where he begins by recounting some of the surveys that were done by uh, William Adam in the 18th, in 1830s. So even as late in this, you have pockets throughout the country where Sanskrit is surviving. I mean, when I read about these things, I feel it is the robustness of the language that has in fact even survived it all. Because later on he makes comparisons with Latin and Greek and so on. But discounting that, he comes to the 19th century where when he study, when he takes a look at the data in the surveys, Sanskrit is in fact very much alive. He considers data from the Bengal as well as the Madras residences. Uh, and when they consider the number of schools that are there, the number of students in there who are learning Sanskrit, it is still very high. But here, because his older arguments don't hold, he feels that the vast majority of the Sanskrit students were engaged in the study of grammar, logic, and law. And because those involved with Kavya alone was a very small number, that he sees as an indicator that the language is declining. So he's not even willing to admit that the 
kind of scholarship that is going on, even in spite of all that onslaught, in those uh, in the other journals, is not seen as uh, something positive. He does admit at a few places that the absence of creation of new literature is not something that the data indicates. Uh, in fact, Asi Majumda, so many others point out that numerous words were still being produced, in spite of all this, were still being produced throughout the country. And in fact, one still needs to go back and unearth some of them and study them from today's age. That, in fact, has not been done. Because under the British uh, Macaulay's Act uh, on Education, one systematically dismantled the structures which enabled Sanskrit learning to take place. Right? The very tradition in which Sanskrit was taught, the oral nature of communication, was taken, was given a complete blow. And instead, one had to learn in the templates that uh, the British thought fit to reduce us. But that is not given any credit as one of the reasons for the failure. <coughs> Socio-political factors, such as anything, whether it is the termination of the Zamindari system, the patronage to pundits that was extended was you know, slowly taken off, none of these are held as responsible. And even during this particular time, in the in the course of uh, Wadeyas in Mysore and, and the Rajputs in Jaipur, the Maratha court of Tanjur, words were still being produced, but Pollock in some sense discounts them. I was reading uh, Majumdar's work and he has actually given a very fine list of all these words that were being produced. I think we can take that up later. And his analysis of it, Pollock's analysis of this period comes down to Sanskrit had chosen to make itself irrelevant to the new world in terms of both the subjects considered acceptable and the audience it was prepared to address. So some of the newer forms that Sanskrit took during the era, whether it was you know, the writing of short stories uh, or even styles of journals which started uh, coming under the influence of the uh, Western impact, all of these are ignored. He then takes the example of uh, Ishwar, Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar, such a bright uh, intellectual, and calls him, Sanskrit intellectuals seemed able to respond only to a challenge made on their own terrain, which is Sanskrit. So whenever you had a call for the intellectuals to rise to the occasion, he believes that they chose the medium of the vernaculars, and hence that is an indicator to the divide that existed between these two streams. Nowhere is a mention of how Vande Mataram, or such a simple, beautiful song, could galvanize a nation. Nowhere there is any mention of how Sanskrit as a mother tongue to the uh, native languages provided a, a very solid background during the freedom movement. None of this is mentioned. All of this, after considering these cases, he comes to his conclusions which are very, uh, which are rather startling, one would say. It is no straightforward manner to configure these four moments of Sanskrit literary culture into a single, plausible, historical narrative. It begins with this, his conclusion. The way I look at it, yes, it is not possible to put together a common thread, because most of his arguments seem highly artificial, as in seem forced. The data may be there, but the interpretation seems highly forced. His methods are basically highlighting highly disconnected moments which suit the case he's trying to make while ignoring all the other data that paints through a contrary picture. Then he goes on to make a case of comparing Sanskrit with uh, the other classical languages of Europe, which is here uh, Greek and Latin. The comparison to Greek is of course a little unfair because um, the way Sanskrit has survived, the way it has adapted, is far resilient compared to what was the literary activity in Greek. After the Greek, he also compares it to Latin and says how both of them died a painful slow death and firstly as instruments of Kavya. That is his uh, uh, viewpoint. He believes that, like how uh, you know Europe went on from Latin, it went over to French and uh, Greek and all the further languages. Similarly, even in India, the decline in Sanskrit led over to all the vernaculars coming up. And this was because of politics of what he calls 
politics of translocal aspiration. And the language became very closely associated only with ritualistic practices. And, and that he sees as a commonality between the two languages. He also admits the differences. The nature of the very nature of vernacularization in Europe and in India have been very different. Because here, those who were very good in vernaculars were also very well versed in Sanskrit. It was not a, a fight between the two for power and so on. He does highlight that. And in boldly declaring what has been the reasons for what he sees as the death, he, dis he emphatically sets aside any impact by the Islamic invasion and states that the barbaric invader often sought to revive it. It was the Hindu kings who were responsible for the decline. So these are the three main causes that he goes on to interest. It's the decline of the throat, the impact of the vernaculars, and the complete breakdown of the civic ethos in the land. So having established all of these conclusions, Pollock ends his essay with this statement. At all events, the fact remains that well before the consolidation of colonialism, even before the establishment of the Islamic political order, the mastery of tradition had become an end in itself for Sanskrit literary culture and reproduction, and rather than the revitalization of the language. This, he says, is the primary reason that uh, Sanskrit is dead. Limiting uh, his uh, you know, conclusion, instead of limiting his conclusions only to the genre of Kavya, it becomes these overreaching uh, uh, statements from a few narrow examples that he has uh, put together from discrete moments uh, of the paper. So this is what I felt from the paper. Thank you. And by the way, by training, she's an astrophysicist and she's an environmentalist, but by her calling, she's now following in the logical studies, also thanks to uh, Sri Rajiv Madhokarji. Uh, I don't think Professor Kandan needs another introduction again, So, but I'll just quickly remind you that he is the academic director, the editor-in-chief for this whole series of um, sessions that we're going to do and he's also the professor of Sanskrit at Jain University in Bangalore. So I'll request you to come over Professor Khan. Uh, this paper uh, Mira and I have written combinedly and uh, our plan was that I speak for some 20 minutes or less and Mira will ask, answer the questions <coughs> because that is the uh, tougher portion so she will handle the questions. <coughs> uh, a, a good many points that uh, Manoj Shastri made and I am going to make are more or less the same because we have chosen the same topic. In this paper, um, when it comes out in print you can see things in greater detail and naturally I have to be uh, somewhat brief and uh, <coughs> this paper aims at five things. Number one, summarize the points made by Pollock in as dispassionate and accurate a manner as possible. Two, analyze the same from various angles. Three, discuss the propriety of the data selected and analyzed by him. Four, discuss the general methodological idiosyncrasies betrayed in his writings, and five, provide pointers to the Uttara Pakshins as to where further work is necessary to possibly uncover more data and do greater justice to the issue. Now my talk is divided into <coughs> four parts. So the Puru Pakshin is the paper of uh, Polong, Depth of Sanskrit, so, um, that we prepare to analyze. One is the thesis of the thesis. So, what is going to say? Uh, part two is the uh, consideration of 
Analysis of the analysis. Number three is the meta analysis of uh, this analysis before its conversion. These are the four dimensions into which uh, my lecture will fall. Right at the outside, what are Wilkes and political issues? So, he takes into account the political scenario of the ascent of BJP to power. <coughs> and he says the Hindutva propagandists have sought to show that Sanskrit is indigenous to India, as if it is not. Sanskrit is considered the source and sole preserver of world culture, as if it is not. So he wants to make what an average Indian and an educated Indian would normally believe as something totally fantastic and unbelievable and groundless, utterly groundless. That's what he wants to make the case out to be. And he, therefore, he says, even with all the awards, grants, and promotion via all India radio, school curricula, etc., Sanskrit is as good as being in a coma, kept alive artificially as an exercise in nostalgia. And hence, in some crucial way, Sanskrit is dead. So, artificial life support systems, it is that uh, Sanskrit is being supported. Going by the attitude shown by our government, who have very carefully followed the legacy of the British, where they are more loyal than the king, it looks like that. They have, they have kept, it in Sanskrit, kept Sanskrit in suspended animation, ensuring that it does not really progress. So compared to the, the kind of attention uh, that the kings gave to Sanskrit, you can see that our governments have been very poor in supporting Sanskrit. And therefore, there is some truth in the point that Sanskrit is being kept artificially alive instead of being actively supporting what was our tradition for something like 5,000 years. So instead of giving me, in fact, it is Pollock who points out that uh, prior to the predominance of English all over the world, if there was one language which is dominant over the entire globe, it was Sanskrit prior to the English. So he knows that, and yet he wants to say that Sanskrit is somehow is it crucially dead in, uh, in some crucial way, Sanskrit is dead. And therefore, all the efforts of the, the present government, so he wrote the paper earlier when NDA government was there, NDA 1 was there, and therefore he wants to say, attack the, see, he has a direct political angle. Um, Rajamulatra has shown on various occasions that it is not without political overtones. Uh, on all his writings, so supposedly academic, but his primary concerns are see, uh, political, and therefore we cannot take it as merely academic, and therefore there are many non-academic issues and involvements in his writings. So, and he has a very peculiar criteria to say uh, that the mission of um, the progress of Sanskrit is to be based only on the quality and the quantity and the production of um, the Kavyas. So this is also another crucial issue. So where he chooses very arbitrary criteria and does not give any justification for the same. In order to prove that um, Sanskrit is dead, he considers four situations. Kashmir in 13th century C, Vijayanagara 16th century C, Mughal court in mid 17th century, and Bengal in 19th century. So the first one he uh, entitles Lady Vanishes. And second one is Vijayanagara and Vidyanagara, he calls it the, the, the city of say, knowledge and the city of Vidya. So, in the first one, in the case of Kashmir, so he says the literature was merely reduced to Sotras, as if the Sotras lack utter creativity. So, one can see abundant creativity in the, in the kind of Sotra literature in India. So, nowhere in the world can you see the kind of creativity even in the Sotras that are known. So, but he wants to reduce it. That is precisely because he's making an appeal to the common man today who is totally disjunct from Sanskrit and he doesn't know what is there in Sanskrit and he will easily fall a prey to the comments of uh, uh, this, this kind of prejudice in the reader. So uh, that way he says that is everything is reduced to more than um, Sotras. And then he always wants to glorify, as Manojna very well pointed out, he always wants to glorify the foreigner 
So, and see, Daun plays the Hindu king. So, in fact, even the even his uh, student, Trushke, has um, recently written. So, she is a very faithful student, she is of uh, Shailar Bolong, and she says that it is Muslim kings who are, you know, see, uh, who are highly uh, patronizing to Sanskrit, and it is Hindu kings that destroyed Sanskrit. So, that tradition is being carried on. So, um, the, he refers to uh, Srivara, says there is no original work. But he also says, his Subhashita already implies a reasonably accomplished curatorial study of Sanskrit, the Sultan's court, or a substantial library. So, uh, on the one hand, he condemns Srivara, and on the other, he glorifies him. And at the same time, he says that he was having to do the patronage of the king, or perhaps he had a good library. So, in other words, no creativity present in the author. So, it can be attributed to all external causes. So, such is the kind of uh, uh, comments that he makes. Coming next to uh, the Vijayanagara Empire, so Vijayanagara and Vidyanagara. So, there he says, uh, there was this, this was the context of the uh, simultaneous patronage of Kannada, Telugu, Sanskrit, and Tamil. All these languages flourished. And he once again wants to bring in, see, bring, uh, bring out a rift between vernacular languages and Sanskrit. So he says, Krishnadeva already did very little to promote courtly literature in Kannada. So you can remember here that Sheldon Pollock has done a lot of work on Kannada also. He knows Kannada quite well. He studied with the one professor T.V. Venkatrathil Shastri in Mysore. So, and he has studied Kannada. He studied old Kannada also. So, because of that knowledge of Kannada, he now tries to pit Kannada against Sanskrit. As Manonya also pointed out very well, all through our tradition, it was what is called Ubhya Bhasha Vidwan. So, if somebody knew Bengali, he also knew Sanskrit very well. That is, if this, this new system came, till the Nikolian system struck roots, it was always the case of Ubhya Bhasha Vidwan. If he was a, a person as a Telugu Pandit, he also knew Sanskrit very well. And in fact, he was a good Telugu Pandit because he knew Sanskrit very well. That was the tradition in our country. In fact, one of the stalwarts of Kannada by name Hamanayaka, in his last interview prior to his death, he made one statement. <coughs> See, in the in the first flush of youth, I committed a blunder for which I have been repenting lifelong. He was the topmost person in Kannada literature. And what he did when he joined the university was remove Sanskrit from the syllabus of Sanskrit, Kannada I mean, so that no Kannada Indian student has any touch of Sanskrit. As a consequence of which he says after 25 years later, after 25 years, he says, today there is not one person left who can read Hada Kannada or Old Kannada in the original and understand it. So I hold myself responsible for it and I regret my decision. So in those days I was a fanatic of Kannada and therefore I sought it that Sanskrit was removed from the syllabus. And it's only now that I realized that it was such a great blunder. So this is the kind of thing that is happening. Today what has happened is you go to an MA of any Indian language, whether it be Kannada MA or Telugu MA or Tamil MA or Hindi MA, the first quality that is see, that you can um, evidence in, they can evidence in him is that he is first a hater of Sanskrit and then a master of that language. So no true mastery of that language because see India was the country which was most famous for its linguistic knowledge. In fact, um, Professor M. B. Emino of Berkeley University has see. Uh, points out two excellences of India. India is great if for nothing else, two things, study of language, study of mind. These are the most difficult things. So it is possible to make fast progress in exact sciences, in what are called hard sciences, say in chemistry, for example. So it is definitely possible to make, because things are tangible there. The most intangible things in the world are language and mind. And Long in pre-Christian era, India had mastered these two languages, the production of Panamese grammar, comparable to which there is no grammar in the entire earth or for any, for any language, in, see, for any language in any language. So in spite of the fact that there are thousands of engineers working today on, say, language processing, so in computation linguistics, there are so many who are working, but they have not been able to produce a language, a grammar book, comparable to Panamese. And what is the bulk of Panamese work? 4,000 sutras. How much does it come to? About 1,000 shlokas. And in, when in print, it comes to 50 pages. Just 50 pages of a grammar book, which can cover the entire grammar of the Sanskrit language, the most complex language it is. So, that is the 
kind of see uh, achievement that has been made. And when it comes to the study of mind, Patanjali Yoga Sutras, less than 200 sutras, all that can be printed in about four pages. In just four pages, he has made such an in-depth study of mind. So, such compactness, so it has been achieved, and such comprehensiveness, the world has not witnessed. In such a country as this, we find that all the linguistic departments are languishing today. And this is most unfortunate that, uh, see, that uh, every Indian uh, local language, vernacular language, has been pitted against Sanskrit and this kind of animosity. So, equating Sanskrit with Brahmins and thereby seeing to it that their enmity is perpetuated. Now, uh, <coughs> he says, uh, he even says that Krishnadeva Raya wrote Amukta Malidan Telugu and not in Kannada. So he is choose to, he can choose to write in the language that pleases him. And it's only you know, to create a rift between Kannada speaking people and Sri Krishna Dev Raya, because Kannada people admire Krishna Dev Raya no end, and therefore he wants to see it that this ends. And therefore there should be no admiration of the past. That is the kind of agenda that he has. And therefore uh, uh, he makes comments like this. So he compares two uh, Mahabharata verse, one in Kannada and one in Sanskrit, and says the Kannada Mahabharata version, Sanskrit Mahabharata by Jiva Rai, hardly known and hardly studied, and tries to once again say pit this against them. <coughs> and all Sanskrit he says was on account of the patronage of kings, and when the empire disappeared, that sounded the death knell for Sanskrit as well. So this is the kind of uh, analysis that he tries to make. And even the work Jambodhi Pranaya that was written by Krishnadeva Raya, <coughs> he, he tries to attribute it to a semi autobiographical status he wants to give. And instead of, see, while well, in, in, in that uh, Kavya, Krishna wins the hand of uh, Jambodhi, and uh, he, he tries to equate it to some historical event in the life of Krishnadeva Raya, why that might not have been actually intended by Krishnadeva Raya at all. Coming to the next portion of uh, the Mughal court where he speaks of the, uh, the so-called lost Sanskrit poet Jagannath Pandita. He speaks of him as very close to us in time and yet we have almost as little concrete evidence about him as we have about the first century master Kalidasa. Now, Westerners have been too very critical of the, the lack of historical sense of uh, Hindu uh, poets or writers or kings or whatever. There is not much of chronicling see, in our country. That is primarily because of the approach to life. So, just as the, the Westerners have their own bias of being see, utterly historical and trying to document every trivial thing also they wanted to document. And this see, history consciousness or history see, fixation, I should say, of the West has been very well analyzed by Rajima Lothra in his very many books. And in our country, so history was relegated to a minor role. And what was more important in life, the important, more important issues in life were paid attention to. And that is why there was less attention to history. Now, even regarding Jagannath Pandita, so he wants to say that what little was novel in Jagannath Pandita was due to his marrying a Muslim woman. So, and he himself says that, see, this is only a story, and it's not substantiated uh, on the one hand. And elsewhere he says that if there is anything original in Jagannath Pandita, it was because of this new connection with Muslim kings, and Muslim courts, and Muslim poets, and because he married a Muslim woman. So he himself, he, he makes this, this kind of uh, contradictions. So again, with regard to Siddhichandra, the same period, with Jain Mom, so he was a person of great personal beauty and charm. And he was proceeded to see uh, convert to Islam, and uh, uh, he says he was open to new ideas because of his association with, say, Abul Fazil and the attributes of Akbar and so on. So uh, there, there were Mughal courtiers like Abdul Rahim who were experimenting with writing in Sanskrit, and um, Sanskrit intellectuals, intellectuals like Siddhi Sindra, they were learning Persian. So it's all this that makes them look something extra. So, in the case of Kavindra Acharya Saraswati, so he perceived Shah Zahan from leaving uh, Jizya tax on the pilgrims, and that's the only point that is worth mentioning about him, according to him. And he says that in the works of, the lives and works of Siddhishendra and Kavindra, <coughs> um, what, is, what stands out is that 
they would resist all other learning as if they had utterly closed minds. And we find that similarly in the case of um, Bengal also. So <clears throat> what was taught then was, see, popularly taught was Nyaya, Vyakarma and other Shastras. And he removes the fact that students pursuing literature are not many in number. Actually speaking, studying literature is not the more difficult of these. Studying the Shastras like Nyaya and Vyakarna and say other Shastras, that is the tougher thing. And those who can do, attempt such tough things can as well read Kavyas on their own. And he wants to say that Kavya was neglected and therefore see, uh, Sanskrit was neglected and so on. So, uh, he draws some peculiar conclusions and he says, even more exclusively associated with narrow forms of religion and priestcraft despite centuries of secular aesthetic. <coughs> so he wants to attack Sanskrit as uh, merely being uh, tools of priestcraft and uh, sotra literature and so on. He ends this, in this section saying, the mental and social spheres of Sanskrit literary production grew ever more constricted and the personal and this worldly and eventually even the pre-century scientists politically evaporated until only the dry sediment of religious hymnology remained. For him, all sotra literature is nothing but dry sediment of religious hymnology. At all events, the fact remains that well before the consolidation of colonialism, before even the establishment of Islamic political order, the mastery of tradition had become an end in itself for poor Sanskrit literary culture and reproduction rather than revitalization, the overriding concern in the field of power of the time, the production of Sanskrit literature had become a paradoxical form of life where prestige and exclusivity were both vital and terminal. So he makes these uh, scathing comments. Now in our country, the very uh, definition and the very purpose of knowledge was quite different from the Western approach. Uh, nothing was pursued for its own sake. Everything was pursued for the sake of the four Purushathas, namely Dharma, Thakama, and Moksha. You can look into the opening of any Shastra. So, as diverse as, say, Ayurveda, or even say, Nati Shastra, the opening declaration is that it is for the sake of the pursuit of the four Purushathas that this Shastra is written. This is the prominent goal of every Shastra. And no, no field, no art or literature was done for its own sake. It is Anand Kumar Swami who pointed out that art for art's sake was never pursued in India. So even the most secular activities of life had a religious orientation. And if there is one thing that is enjoined to be done for its own sake, it is what Patanjali says. He says, Brahmane, Nishkaranaha, Vedaha, Sasadango, Adhyayo, Gyayascha. So for no reason at all must a brand study the Vedas along with the Vedangas and he must understand them. So, just studying the Vedas itself, learning them by heart, it's a lifetime task. So, it's not an easy thing. So, vast is the literature. So, those who come from single book religions can't understand the gravity of the situation here and the enormity of the task here. And therefore, it was the task of the Brahmana to study the Vedas along with the six Angas. And this requires me enormous you see, inputs of time and energy. And the very approach to life is most beautifully. Why should knowledge be the pursue? India has set a very uh, excellent uh, see, pattern for that. There is a beautiful verse in Mahabharata which says, Aharartham karma kuriya danindyam kuriya daharam prana sandharanartham prana sandhariyaha tattva vijnana heto tattvam gnayam gena guryona janma. So, he says, it says, take up a job and work. And why should you do that? for the sake of food, ahar artham. Why should you consume food? Prana sandharana artham, to sustain life. Why should you sustain life? In order to know the tattva, tattva vijnana heto. Why should you know tattva? It is for the reason that ye na bhuyo na janma, that you may not be reborn, that you may attain the final state of moksha. So, this was the pattern that was set. And for every person, the, the way to moksha was open. So, it's not merely for the brahmana. So, Sve Sve Karman Nibirataha, see Siddhim Vindati Mahama says the Bhagavad Gita and therefore uh, it is open to everyone. And this kind of uh, uh, art for art's sake was never ever see, uh, pursued. Now, 
what uh, Pollock does is focusing on a very narrow range of a very vast spectrum. See, it is Westerners, as, as uh, Raju Malukka was pointing out in the morning, it is the Westerners who put, put the picture together, collecting the various pieces from see, various branches. So somebody knows only Sanskrit, somebody knows only archaeology and so on. So all these pictures were put together by the British and the Westerners and in fact they had they could have had a better picture of India than some of the Indians themselves could do because these could not get easily an integrated picture and having got that picture they could they did everything that they could sabotage. Now <coughs> Polak always emphasizes good effects of for example Sultan uh, Zainul Abidin and he would like to emphasize on the, the badness of uh, Hindu kings. And when Hanadir points out that Jagannath being called the last Sanskrit poet is not warranted, as there are works such as those of Ambika Dutta Vyasa, Mahakavya, Nepali scholar, Sukriti Dutta, Panda, and writings of Kshamarao in the recent times, in the post independence period also. In fact, if you want to look into modern Sanskrit literature, 19th and 20th century literature, there is an abundance of that. And one can produce counter evidence for uh, Pollock's claims here. And number two, another technique that uh, he does is list and dismiss. So, great job or he suggests the loss of valuable texts by files that destroy libraries in Kashmir, find a very casual mention. So, look at the, the casual way in which he says important creative texts may have disappeared as if books have capacity to disappear on their own. So perhaps in all the files that periodically engulf the capital of Kashmir. So he doesn't want to say Muslims did it, the invaders did it. So he, would not, he, would, he has to whitewash them. So and show that they are all great and pure or whatever. Or in the Mongol invasion of 1320, which according to the 16th century Persian chronicle left the country in ruins. Texts may have simply eluded the notice of modern editors. However carefully they may have combed the massive collections of Kashmir, but none of the, all these possibilities seems very likely. So he contradicts himself very well. So he gives some um, three or four possibilities and ultimately dismisses them without assigning any reason. So he says, but none of these possibilities seems very likely. Why? Why do they seem so? He doesn't explain. <clears throat> On the other hand, we have, for example, in Srivara's Rajatarangini, he says how the king Sikandar destroyed libraries. So I have given the reference here. Sikandar Dharanathaha Yavanai Preritaf Pura Pustakanaja Sarvani Pranan Yagniri Vada. So he says he burnt libraries. So like fire burning grass, libraries were burnt. So there is this see, evidence from Rajatarangini. So such is the see, love of knowledge of those uh, great invaders. So uh, that Gudshikan, that very title means the destroyer of idols. So similarly, uh, in the case of Vijayanagara, uh, Suvil writes that the fallen capital, Vijayanagara, was ruthlessly pillaged and destroyed for five months. So, you can imagine the amount of uh, the richness of that village. And the, the kind of logic that he uses, he says, for example, <coughs> perhaps, probably, and therefore. So, this kind of uh, uh, logic that Arun Chaudhary also points out. He makes a statement with, uh, uh, see, with uh, the prefix, perhaps this happened. And in under, after two paragraphs, he says, probably this happened. And in the last paragraph, he says, therefore this happened. So, <laughs> so, the, so it's only uh, conjecture upon conjecture okay, that he makes. And the way he presents it, as though he has been able to arrive at a conclusion based on solid facts. So. There is a, there is a uh, nice or rather bad comment about uh, history. <coughs> See, whereas in science we start with facts first and then try to build theories over it. History is, he says, <coughs> history is hardcore interpretation surrounded by a pulp of disputable facts. <laughs> so we should have hardcore facts and interpretation should surround that. So history is the reverse of that. So this is exactly, he is very faithful to being such a historian. So, um, in sum, by assuming a disputed conjecture to be fact, you know, for example, even in the case of uh, Jagannath Pandita, he says, Dhamini Vidansa is good because it is autobiographical. So, uh, he, he is 
uh, uh, him some uh, yes, some personal event in his life, so and therefore this is good and so on. So uh, making Bhavani Vidasa a personal narrative, and it is about his beloved who was a Muslim and trying to explain the inconsistencies in the points of view of Jagannatha in his poetic and scholarly verse. Falak is discarding simple and plausible explanations in favor of complicated and unlikely speculations. So even the selection of data and see only whatever is very convenient for him, he selects such data and whatever is inconvenient he discards. So what happens is for a, a typical reader who is generally ignorant of history also and doesn't get the total picture. So he, is, he sees that some of the facts cited by him are true and he is likely to be confused that the whole picture given by him is true whereas he is making this kind of uh, say, selective representation. As time is running out, uh, I will not uh, go in further detail. Um, there is a uh, <coughs> good deal of um, meta-analysis at the end. So uh, I will only read out the headings of these points I, I, because I cannot uh, completely cover them now. Choosing a narrow definition to determine the vitality of a tradition or language. So that is one of the techniques that he makes use of. These are these come from analysis. Selecting data to fit a theme. So I have given some illustrations already. Selecting playing, selective playing up and playing down. If it is a question of a, a Muslim ruler, so he plays up. If it is a question of Hindu ruler, it's play plays down all the achievements. So he already has some theories uh, defined and uh, uh, and then using frameworks of social science and modern psychology and anthropology in biblical studies to simply pose on traditional Indian thought and then list and dismiss. Now you can come out with some counter arguments for uh, uh, what Pollock says but he, you know, he can anticipate that and he makes a mention of that, passing mention of that and says that these are all worthless arguments and so you should see you should feel that you have no new point to make or something. Like and then Divida et Impera. So um, the way he can create this. Um, so anyhow, you can uh, you can see that uh, uh, this uh, handler rightly points to the essential cultural misunderstanding that Pollock displays when he repeatedly points to the death of Sanskrit. So he says Sanskrit was born and dead, and then he says in different centuries Sanskrit died again, Sanskrit died again. If something was born dead, how can it die again and again? So, uh, anyhow, it is because, and uh, the point is, since 2001, so for 15 years, nobody has done a critique of this. And uh, must give it the full credit to Rajima Lodra to bring it to the attention of Sanskritists and uh, make us see a serious attempt to see the fallacies of this logic. So, I thank Rajima Lodra for this uh, wonderful moment. And uh, it's open to questions. Mira will be ready to answer questions.